Just because you don't like what science has to say to you does not mean it's not serving humanitarian ends. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Sam. If you're one of my 5,000 subscribers, I just want to say thank you so, so much for getting me past the 5,000 subscriber mark. Um, the channel is only just a year old. It will be a year old in January. And never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be at 5,000 subscribers in one year. So I just really wanted to put out a heartfelt thank you um, and let you know that I appreciate each and every one of you being here. Um, you mean so much to me. And I actually truly love um, reading the things that you leave in the comment section for me. Um, I feel like we've built a cute little community. So I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, if you're new here, you can still become a subscriber. We would love to have you as a part of the channel. I upload weekly and we just talk through some internet nonsense. Um, I'm usually trying to make sense of it using some research, um, some logic, and maybe a little bit of sass. So if you like today's video, I hope that you'll consider subscribing so that you never miss another upload from me. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Did you notice that the lighting is different? <laughs> I went ahead and I made it a little bit darker in the room that I'm filming in um, just for today because I really wanted these blue lights to pop. Um, we just decorated for Christmas because December is upon us. And so I was hoping by doing a little bit different lighting in this video, um, you could really see the blue and it would help get us all into the holiday spirit. So there's that. I hope you enjoy this. You'll have to let me know in the comment section what you think, because uh, I know a few of you are sick of looking at the brick background, um, but it is the best place for me to film um, in my apartment because my neighbors are noisy AF. So <laughs> I thought I'd make it a little bit more festive for us this time around. So in talking about hitting the 5,000 subscriber mark, um, one of you left a note in the comment section for me. I think it might have been on that community tab post that I made, but it could have also been in one of my most recent videos talking about the new holiday ad by Ulta called The Beauty Of... Dot, dot, dot. And this specific episode is called The Beauty Of Fatness featuring Virgie Tovar. I just want to say thank you so, so much for putting me onto this because I definitely went and listened to it and I was like, ooh, there are little tidbits of information that we definitely should talk about. So let's dive in to this interview with Virgie Tovar. So Virgie sits down with a podcast host. His name is David Lopez and he describes himself as a celebrity hairstylist and beauty influencer. And he tells us that the podcast is all about talking with the pioneers of beauty to figure out what beauty is and where beauty lives. And he tells us they're going to sit down today to talk about fat phobia and the intersectionality between fat activism and other social movements. Let's dive right in. The first thing I want to point out, because these always make me laugh, whether it's on a podcast or like a TV show, but like that little bar that pops up and, you know, it has their name. So it says Virgie Tovar. And then you can see they're describing her as an author, which is true, an activist, which is true, and then a weight-based discrimination expert. And I'm just wondering, how do you become a weight-based discrimination expert? Is there a degree in that? Anyway, sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> We're getting started with a little bit of sass because that's just where I'm at today. Anyway, the first key point that I took away from watching this podcast was when she answered his question about describing the difference between fat phobia and fat activism. Her answer is a little bit long and it is a little bit rambly. I listened to it slowed down so that I could take notes and I was like, whoa, these are not complete sentences. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break down her answer just a bit so that we can pinpoint the little pieces that we wanna talk about. Here is the first point she makes when answering the question, what is the difference between fat phobia and fat activism? Yeah, so I mean, fat phobia is a form of bigotry, right? Mm. And a lot of people don't know that because we've been taught that our attitudes towards higher weight people are rightfully negative because of health reasons, mm, right? Right, And so we've got this, I mean, oh, I could, I mean, I could go into this for a million years. I, I will parenthetically say that our notion of health is 
deeply flawed, problematic, and kind of living in the 1800s. Like the BMI was invented in the 1800s, okay? Um, (laughs) By by European men. Yeah, by like this Belgian mathematician. He wasn't even a physician. And he ended up becoming the grandfather of eugenics. (laughs) So like just to contextualize how we're defining health, it's by a Belgian mathematician from 1830. Right who was the grandfather of eugenics. So, end parentheses. Uh Here, right off the bat, Virgie is describing fat phobia as a form of bigotry that is socially acceptable right now because it's okay to treat overweight people negatively because health reasons. She then, in her rambling answer, says, for the record, let's also contextualize what health means, and then says that it is problematic flawed, and living in the 1800s. I wonder where this is going. Okay, we all knew where this was going. The BMI was created in the 1800s by a Belgian mathematician, and she goes out of her way to say, not even a physician, a mathematician, and that this man ended up becoming the grandfather of eugenics. Was anyone else surprised to hear this information coming from a fat activist? At this point, I am not. And also, for the record, I don't understand why she went out of her way to say he wasn't even a physician. Because at this point, even if he had been a physician, would they have cared? They don't listen to or like doctors anyway. So what does it really matter if he was a mathematician or a physician? Either way, they're fat phobic and wrong, right? So what was the purpose of putting that in there? But I paused on this moment once again, because just like I talked about in my last Fearing the Black Body episode, um, which just came out on my channel a few weeks ago, there is a reason that mathematicians and physicians worked together to create these tables. Doctors put out an overwhelming amount of data. I mean, think about it. When you go to the doctor's office, they're capturing your weight, your height, all of your blood levels. There are various things that they're checking. They're putting those into charts and then the charts are just being stored. This is a lot of data, especially because they're seeing hundreds of patients. Well, what's the best way to use those mounds of data? Give them to a statistician or a mathematician so that they can put the data into something workable. And according to this article that I found specifically for the Fearing the Black Body episode, you can see that this process and this partnership of them working together actually helped to streamline medicine because it was able to flag different trends that were happening. So once you lay it out more logically like that, it makes sense that a mathematician would have created the BMI chart and not a physician. It's really not all they make it out to be. And now she isn't wrong that he went on to become a grandfather of eugenics. I will give her that. Again, that is not incorrect, but I want to talk about why the BMI still exists because she definitely questions it in this moment. There are a lot of fat activists out there on TikTok questioning why the BMI exists. It's because based on how science works, it hasn't been disproven. What they would need to do is A, figure out that that method is bad, and then B, present another method that's peer-reviewed that is equal or above the standard of the BMI. And so far that hasn't happened. And that is how science works. And that is why the BMI chart sticks. But it seems like maybe we are forgetting how science works because I do know there are fat activists out there like Hannah Talks Bodies who are calling for the BMI to go away with nothing replacing it. Anytime I talk about the problems with the BMI, the most common response I always get is, okay, well, what should we use instead? And the answer, is nothing. Okay, moving on, we can see that Virgie states this. In fact, fat phobia is an actual legitimate form of discrimination. It aligns with other types of discrimination, like around race or gender or, or you know, or any number of marginalized identities um, in the sense that, you know, it's largely a belief system that isn't really based in evidence or data or science, but that is socially condoned and creates an idea of some people are better than others. Right. Right. And so fat phobia manifests in a lot of different ways, like everything from a wage gap, 
like plus size women make $9,000 to $19,000 less per year than straight size women. There's also well-documented medical discrimination and things like, you know, things we all know, like how higher weight people are considered less appealing partners, less appealing dates. So there's all these different, obviously fashion, like there's all different ways that fat phobia manifests. Um, and it's legal in 48 out of 50 states. So just to be clear, like you can be overtly fired for your weight and get in absolutely no trouble in 48 out of 50 states. So that's that. I mean, fat activism is sort of the response to fat phobia. It's essentially kind of an intersectional um, politic that looks at fat phobia and says, this is wrong. There's nothing wrong with being fat. This is totally a natural part of body diversity. Yes, fat people have thriving, wonderful, beautiful lives. Yes, fat people are desirable. And absolutely, fat people should be protected from things like medical discrimination and the wage gap. You know, I mean, so like that's that's what those two things are. Like one is the problem and fat activism is the response. So in this rambling bit of her answer, we see her saying that it's a legitimate form of discrimination because it's not based with evidence or science or data, uh, but it's socially accepted. So that is what makes it a legitimate form of discrimination, just like discrimination faced by other groups of protected peoples. She goes on to state that there is a wage gap where fat women make less money than straight-sized women. She also says that they can be fired legally in 48 states just for being overweight, that fat people face medical discrimination, and that also they're viewed as less appealing partners and less appealing dates. So that was a lot um, for one sentence of her answer. Like it literally ran on forever and ever. And there's no citation in it at all. She didn't even say research shows that in 48 states you can be fired for being overweight or that there's a wage gap. None of that. Once again, does that surprise anyone? Did not surprise me. And then just like we've seen in other components of fat activism, she quickly moves on so she can say, but fat activism is the hero. Fat activism is the polar opposite of that. That's the purpose of it is to fight these things that are happening. She actually states that fat activism is a politic that says, yes, it's acceptable to be fat. It's okay to be fat. Fat people are desirable. Fat people are good partners. Fat people live thriving, wonderful, beautiful lives. Fat people don't deserve to be discriminated against by medical professionals. Fat people don't deserve to be fired for being overweight. And fat people don't deserve to have to work within a wage gap. And I found this particularly interesting because typically when you're speaking, you tend to prioritize things and the order in which they come out of your mouth is the priority. And so I just found it interesting that the wage gap, the discrimination, all of that was sort of at the bottom of her priority list. It was the last thing that she listed where being desirable, being wanted, living a thriving life. Those were all the top things. Almost like she's trying to convince us that they do have those things, right? It was honestly a little bit of an aha moment because this perfectly explains how a lot of fat acceptance activists think. They want to be seen as desirable and they want to come online and prove that they're thriving and living beautiful lives. But when they come online, they're typically not doing those things. They're typically yelling and angry and raging at people. So... How is that proving that you are desirable and have a lot of friends or whatever they're trying to prove? Like, I think they almost miss that. Like, if you're doing that, great. You could capture that in a still photo for your Instagram. But coming online and just raging at a camera does not give off vibes that you are living your best life. Because you would be living your best life, right? Not raging at a camera. So... Like, there's a little bit of a disconnect there. And I feel like maybe I understand, but honestly, it just makes my brain hurt. Then she adds this. And I think I want to say, right, like, our current cultural attitude is that the the solution to fat phobia is for fat people to become thin people. (laughs) And we were never, I'm not a thin person. There's not a secretly a thin person inside of me. There's, you know what I mean? There's There's this prevailing myth. And this is so important, right? Even people who understand what fat phobia is and and really don't want to perpetuate ideas of fat phobia, they might still believe 
that a fat person is secretly a thin person. Mm-hmm. And that I'm I'm really here to like dismantle it. So I see like the culture is like, oh, solution to fat phobia, just try and force and bully every fat person to become a thin person. This bit was intriguing to me because we can see her in the interview saying that people think the solution is for fat people to become thin people. And so to fulfill that solution, they should bully fat people into becoming thin people. And we have seen this out on the internet with things like The Biggest Loser, people trolling fat people. Like these are things that actually happen. So she's not entirely wrong. But her answer is so specific and so vague all at the same time. And that's why I was like, ooh, this is very interesting. I want to just sort of like suss this out a little bit, right? It intrigued me because Virgie is describing a binary of being fat or thin without being descript. What defines fat? What defines being thin or that you're thin? Like, where is the line drawn? Because I went back and I was looking at Virgie's social media, specifically her Instagram. And I mean, I scrolled all the way to the beginning. (laughs) of Instagram and oh my god it was a lot of posts because she started posting I think in like 2012 or 2013 and she's been posting pretty regularly on there but I scrolled all the way back and the truth is Virgie is one of those people who has not gained a massive amount of weight while being a fat activist. She's pretty much stayed the same size and she says at one point during this interview that she is a size 18 to 20 which would be a small fat according to the fatness scale. So it appears maybe she's been this way her whole life and maybe she's right. Maybe at this weight she is healthy and close to her markers and maybe that's it. So maybe that is the best size for Virgie because she's clearly been this size for a while. But I think what she's missing is looking at a broader picture of people. What about people like me who were thinner and then gained weight due to a disorder. It would be acceptable to tell me that I need to get back down to a healthier size because I have not been this size my whole life and it has been negatively impacting my health overall. It bothers me that she speaks about these topics with such broad sweeping strokes, not looking at the nuance, the differences between people and bodies and life histories. Maybe 18 to 20 is a good, healthy size for Virgie. That does not mean that's a good, healthy size for everyone. And I would never advocate for bullying. I do not think that bullying and fat shaming is a good way to help anyone. That is not how I am good at taking criticism. And I know that it causes other people to shut down as well. But I do think that people deserve to know how the choices they're making affect their overall health and well-being because once they have all the information it's up to them to decide what to do with it. So the conversation continues and it kind of proves the points that I was just making because the host asks Virgie to define then what health means to her and ooh the discomfort. You can see it all over her face, her body language changes a little bit, she is visibly uncomfortable defining what health is. She's perfectly capable of tearing it down, but does not want to define what health means to her. And again, I just found that interesting. So I just want to take a little listen here to her answer. Really? What is your definition of health? Mm, Yeah, that's really complicated, right? I I think I want to sort of, I want to talk about that question, but I want to start by saying that you know, no one has to be healthy. Tea. No, right? Like, Tea. I mean, it's like, no, like there is no governing body that's like out there putting, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like no one owes anybody that in, in either the traditional sense of the word or any other more innovative or, you know, more politicized, maybe even version of that word. Did y'all see her squirm like a little politician and trying to get around answering the question? because I sure did. And right off the bat, we get an immediate fat activist talking point, right? Which is nobody owes anybody else their health. You don't owe your health to anybody. There's no governing body telling you that you have to be healthy. And while she is correct, again, I think we're missing some nuance to the conversation. Because while it's true that no one has to be healthy, I think there are certainly a lot of people out there who would have made different choices if all the information had been laid out in front of them. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. 
but I'll use myself as an example. So I was a vegan for about five years. Prior to me going vegan, if my doctor had said, listen, you don't absorb iron like a normal human. So if you cut all of the iron out of your diet via meat sources, even if you take an iron supplement, that is not going to be enough for you. It is going to make you severely anemic to the point that you may need a blood transfusion. If someone had said that to me prior to my vegan journey, I may not have taken those steps in that order to get myself to a point of anemia where they literally were like, if you don't start eating meat, we are going to have to give you a blood transfusion. <laughs> I might have made different choices if I had had all of the information, but the truth is I didn't because I thought I was wise and slick, right? In my 20s, like I can do whatever I want. It doesn't matter what my doctor says. That's exactly what I've been talking about. People need as much information as possible. They should be getting it from medical professionals, not folks online. <laughs> and then they and they alone need to make the choice once they have all of the information. Because she isn't wrong when she talks about bodily autonomy, people have the right to choose what they want to do with their bodies, but going around and telling people that it is healthy to be overweight or to be a vegan without taking iron supplements, in my case, is dangerous and we should not be doing that. If someone knows, hey, eating junk food is going to make you gain weight, gaining weight might be bad for your joints, Losing your joints might mean that you need a knee replacement sooner, a hip replacement sooner than more people. You might lose your mobility as you gain weight and that's going to hurt you this, this, and this way when you're old. Then they can make those choices. But going around telling people that that is healthy and just letting them do whatever they will is not very responsible. So... Again, just wanted to put a little pin in that conversation. Then she rambles on and somewhere in the ramble, she admits that she has actively taken from the disability activism movement to pull into the fat acceptance movement certain principles that she likes and how they advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. Then she says she wishes there wasn't health-based gatekeeping and Honestly, I don't even know what that means, so I'm not going to pause on it for very long because then she says this. Actually, like a friend who's who's a PhD in nutrition and she she brought up this incredible question to me and she was like, if science isn't serving humanitarian ends, then what is the point that we're doing? Like, what's the point of it? You know? And it's like, right. Cause are, are we making science for aliens for like some, I mean, like, what are we, you know what I'm saying? It's so like, so if, if, if by our scientific notion of whatever health is right now, if that's excluding 68% of the population, which is like the plus size population, if that's excluding 70 ish percent of the U S population, then it's not working. It's not <sighs> All right. Just, one, just give me one second here. Let me just, whew. okay. What is this trash? Like, what was this whole little segment about if science isn't serving humanitarian efforts, what is science doing? I just, I'm sorry. I need just one. What is this nonsensical trash? And Honestly, while I'm just trying to gather my life, please enjoy this clip of the host reacting to her taking him to church in slow motion because honestly, it was ridiculous. Um, while I was taking notes for this, I glanced up and I was like, oh my God, why? Why are we feeding into this trash? Just enjoy this, please. I need a second. So here she is saying, if science isn't serving humanitarian ends and is excluding 70% of the U.S. population, then what's the purpose of science? Like, what are we making science for aliens? And I, like, my brain is exploding. Like, girl, what the fuck you mean science is excluding fat people? What do you mean? Science is almost exclusively focused on fat people. Right? That's what they mean when they say they're trying to help the obesity epidemic. Just because you don't like what science has to say to you does not mean it's not serving humanitarian ends. Like, 
that's not how that works. All right, I gotta keep us moving because uh, it could take my brain all day to catch up to that nonsense. Now the next part is another rambling mess. So we're gonna skip a little bit to the part where the host asks her, so what's the one thing in the world today that kind of drives you crazy? Here's her answer. <gasps> OMG. Okay, you know, I, I'm gonna go, I mean, there's so many things. So I'm just gonna pick the first thing off the top, right? Like injustice, mm. right? But here's the thing about injustice, okay? It not only is anti-humanitarian, but it's anti-scientific, it's anti-data, it's anti-logic, and it's anti-reason. So I'm like, girl, if this made sense and it was also poopsy, okay. <laughs> Like, I'll give that to you. It's fi fiduciarily, like, right. sound, but it sucks for everybody. All right. But, like, none of this makes any sense. Like, homophobia, losing money. Fat phobia, losing money. Yep. Fucking homophobia, losing money. Right? Like, I'm just like, like, we're not gaining anything from... So I think, like, the nonsensicalness yeah. of injustice is, like, what really gets to me. Yeah. I'm like, there is nothing pragmatic about this. This is just some mythology garbage that somebody made up so such as like, you know, the Belgian mathematician who made up the BMI, yeah. right? Just like completely fantastical, not based in absolutely anything except like cuckoo pantsia. Um, and so that's my answer. Now, injustice is a good answer. And the explanation isn't all bad until she starts to get to the end. <laughs> Did anyone else catch the little tidbit about her calling it made up garbage, mythology, not based in logic, and then throwing in the little slight Almost like the made-up trash that is the BMI created out of nowhere by a Belgian mathematician. Girl, what are we doing? We have already talked about the BMI, so I'm not going to dive into that. But here again, we see these little slights and we see her leading these talking points that we're seeing other fat activists latch onto, where they're like, the BMI is not based in logic, it's not based in evidence, it's not based in research, which is not the truth. <laughs> I just, I just want them to stop trying to make that happen. It's like Mean Girls, right? Like, stop trying to make Fetch happen. It is never going to happen. But this is on par for fat acceptance. Any data set they don't agree with, fat phobic. Any science they don't agree with, fat phobic. And it's just so disingenuous that I just, I can't look past it. So I had to just include that here because I was like, girl, what, what are we doing? Now, finally, I want to talk about this last clip where he asks her, what in your beauty routine do you feel like you do just for you? I'm kind of thinking, can it include style or do of we have course. to keep it to be? Okay. Uh, no, of course. Okay. So, I mean, I think for me, like my fashion practice and specifically the documentation of my fat body, my fat brown woman body in garments um is is just for me like I mean, I, it's like really the self-documentation piece is so important to me not only because of my own values but because of like the historical reality that you know up until recently up until we had cameras on our phones it was fat phobes who were creating images of all fat people so they were consistently undignified consistently unidimensional like you know um dehumanizing and so for me i see my self documentation as part of this resistance against kind of resistance against that history but also like you know creating roads for myself and for other fat people. And so like, I think, you know, it's, it's absolutely a practice. It's not just for me, I guess, but like, it's feels like it's primarily for me. So here she tells us that she documents herself on social media in her fashion, because prior to her doing this, and prior to us having cameras on our phones, fat phobes were the only ones creating images of fat people, and they were always viewed as disgusting, they were unidimensional, and the images were dehumanizing. She views her own social media as dismantling that history. And this intrigues me, having read Fearing the Black Body by Sabrina Strings, because a huge chunk of that book, Sabrina Strings is diving into art history and how the female form, the fat, the thick, the voluptuous female form was seen as beautiful. So what are we doing? 
why are we completely contradicting everything? Like, what is the purpose of this answer saying that the victors of history, right? Because this is a typical thing. The victors write history. She's saying that the fat phobes were the previous victors and they were always showing fat people as dehumanized, which is not true. And she sees herself, right, as some sort of savior. She's redefining that. She is single-handedly dismantling that history that fat phobes have created. Like, how egotistical does that sound when you hear it that way? Right? Because, I mean, that's exactly what she just said. It showed how Virgie really views herself, right? As some sort of savior of fat people. And she's just bringing this army of fat activists right along with her. It also offers more insight on how fat acceptance views themselves, right? Because we see them online all the time thinking that everyone else's world revolves around them, that everyone is so focused in on them, that there are things that they do that thin people just hate. When that's just simply not the truth. Most people do not care. <laughs> you are free to live your life as you like. Nobody else's world is revolved around you. But that is how they see themselves. And Virgie has made that clear once again with this answer. I also didn't quite understand why Virgie said she chose to document herself and her fashion for only herself because then she wouldn't necessarily have put it all over social media if it was just for herself. And she has used these social media platforms to build her business and earn a living. But I guess that's not as interesting a story to say, hey, I just started posting photos on Instagram because I learned that I could make money online. Because maybe it shows that it's less about resistance and more about making money? Oops, sorry if I just uncovered your whole scheme, Virgie. All right, that is all I have for today. Did you watch this Ulta ad? Have you seen any other podcasts from them? Are there any other topics you want me to talk about? feel free to let me know in the comment section below. I love reading um, all of your responses to the video. Thank you so much for being here and watching this video today. I will see you in the next one. Bye!